books. And first and foremost, it is a website. Okay, so you can search for Google Books through the app. I'm going to focus on showing you methods on desktop. I just find when I'm digging into Google Books, I think it's easier to work on your computer on your desktop on a bigger screen. But you can certainly do this through um, Playbooks as well. They're free. So they're absolutely free. Um, you don't really even have to have a Google account to work with Google Books. You can just search it. The only reason you would really need a Google account on desktop is to use the My Library feature. And I go into that in the premium video class, but uh, we're not really getting into that here, although that's a great place to collect the stuff that you find. So let me look here. Okay, so here's the website. And you can search for books through Google Books at google.com. Um, you would end up with your search results and you know how you're normally in web view and you can switch over to image view, you know, results or video results. Well, books are typically one of the options. The only reason why you wouldn't see it is if there aren't a lot of book results to match what you're looking for, which happens. And if that's the case, you'll see more as a category. And so you would click more and chances are you'll find a couple of results out of Google Books for whatever it is you're looking at. Uh, and you can see the My Library link. If you're logged into your free Google account, then you can use that as kind of a place to collect the stuff that you find. Our first item that you could find is Ancestry Magazine. Now, I know we have folks in our chat today, and certainly those who'll be watching later the replay, who've been at genealogy for a long time. And you re may remember Ancestry Magazine. Um, it was out for about 10 years. And it was a great publication. As you know, I write a column for Family Tree Magazine, which came out just after Ancestry. And um, these have all been digitized and are not only in Google Books, completely searchable. So things change, right? And so there's going to be websites that you might read about in Ancestry that are discontinued or the links have changed or, you know, things change. But a lot of the core of research doesn't. The history doesn't. And so if you're really looking to get up to speed on a particular subject, whether it's, you know, what was um, the history behind Ellis Island? Or what's it like to do? You know, where do I go to start German research? Um, there's a lot of free articles out here on Google, .com, um, Google Books that you can find in Ancestry. So we're going to just do a search on Ancestry Magazine. Okay, so there you can see um, that our research results, there's a lot of issues. Like I said, there was about 10 years worth. And to the best of my knowledge, all the issues have been digitized, are fully digitized, searchable, and free. So pretty cool. Let's click one of these. Um, so this one, we have here January, February 2003. Wow, <laughs> time flies. I remember when this issue came out. I'm going to click the thumbnail button. Do you see that up here? This is a really nice way. We're going to use this throughout our time together today because it's a great way to get a nice big visual view of what's available in whatever the item is that you're looking at. And here's one, Proving Family Lore by John Coletta. So this is about, um, you know, crossing in ships and what was that like and what kind of stories came along and how do you kind of just figure out uh, the accuracy with by digging into the actual records. So this could be very applicable to what you're doing today. So this is kind of a fun resource. Now over here on the left, you'll notice um, Ancestry Magazine shows up in the old classic view. You'll see view all magazines, browse all issues, and then there's a search box. In the new version of Google Books, which I'm not sure why the magazine didn't pop up in the new interface, but it's still showing up in this old interface. Uh, there's a search box at the top of the screen on the new version. But here we can put in the word shipwreck and it's gonna grab every page that has that word appearing on the page. So it's using optical character recognition to find the stuff that we want, which is great. And here we can look at um, browsing all the issues. So if you're like, well, I don't know, 
oh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the magazine. I just want to look at, see what's there. Click browse all the issues. And now you can look at it in list view or cover view. So this is cover view so that you can see, um, if you see there, May, June, 2006, I'm in that issue. <laughs> that was before I started the podcast. Um, okay, so here's list view. <clears throat> And um, it's a great way to kind of just dig through and just see what kind of topics they had. So who knew that Ancestry Magazine was over here in Google Books? And <clears throat> again, topic searchable. I think that's what's cool. Now you can search all the issues too. You can click the box for search all the issues. Put in my name. There's that issue. It found me. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's a great resource. But <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, hang on. I knew I would need my Earl Grey tea. So <clears throat> Ancestry Magazine is not the only item. <clears throat> now, one of the things I want to mention to you before I show you the other magazines that are in here is that when you're looking at a magazine, it's, it's nice to do the two-page spread, right? Because a lot of times they're laid out that way as magazines. Remember where the thumbnail button was up here? I don't know if you can see my mouse, but up here under the search box, we had that checkerboard looking button that gave us all the images. <clears throat> I don't know why this is happening. Hang on. <clears throat> it's only because I'm excited about the interesting things you can find in Google Books. Next to that button is a two page spread. And if you click that, it will give it to you in a layout with two pages. Okay, but that's just one of many, many magazines. So I had to do some digging to find how can you see all the magazines that are available. And it's this URL, books.google.com slash books slash magazines. It's kind of hard to get through by actually clicking through the interface. So in the show notes, I will have this link for you so that you can click through and just browse. You'll find that many of these have many years digitized. Others, I'm noticing more and more, they have one issue. And they do that so that their magazine will pop up, will catch your interest, and maybe you'll go subscribe. So that's fine. It gives you a chance to kind of take a look at it and see what it's about. Lots and lots of magazines in here. I love that Life Magazine is in here. If you're looking for something that just kind of fills in the, the, the history, what's going on in the world at any given time in the last, in the 20th century, Life Magazine is kind of, and it's just fun to go through. It is. It's just fun to go through. So they have 1953 through 53 through 1972. So check out Life Magazine. That one's kind of fun. All right. Our second item is city directories. Now, again, typically when you go to Google Books, you're not getting these kinds of items. You might be getting Jane Austen novels, or you might be getting a lot of books that are uh, newly published. You can't click through. You can't re read them because... Um, they haven't had permission to digitize them. The author or the publisher has to agree to that. Google Books has run into some challenges with them in the past. They've kind of worked those things out and figured out a method for who will be digitized, who will not. Um, but what was interesting was in the history of Google Books, when they went to digitize, they went to archives and a lot of university libraries. And so they did end up getting their hands on books that were in the public domain that weren't the classic novels or nonfiction, but really, you know, working books. I call them, you know, they're, they're books that have purposes and um, you use them and as a reference. So these reference books like city directories. So you could just go in and do a simple search for city directory, okay? And that's okay, but you're gonna get a lot of results and it, it may just be books that mention the word city and the word directories. So you know what that's going to mean is it's not going to be a city directory at all. It's just going to have those words in the text. We can get around that. So I encourage you to use search operators. I know lots of you guys have my book, The Genealogist Google Toolbox, that so we talk a lot about search operators. There are many, many, but some of the ones that you can use here to zero in on city directories um, are the, some of the most common ones that we use. Quotation marks would be one. So if I wanted to find a city directory for the city of Nashville, I would put 
Nashville in quotation marks. So that makes the, the name of the town mandatory, that every book result I get is going to have that word, that name. If we don't put quotation marks, sometimes the results have some of the words, but not all the words, right? And then how about city directory? Now, if you put quotation marks around city directory, but the book is called the city business directory, you won't get that result. And the reason is that quotation marks tell Google, which is the search engine behind Google Books, it tells Google, hey, these, these words have to be there. They have to be in this order and they have to be together as a phrase, nothing else in between. So you can use the asterisk and you can see here, I've done this in my search query, Nashville in quotes, city directory in quotes, but I put that asterisk between city and directory. That way I can get city business directory, city telephone and address directory. You can see how effective that is because it's going to narrow things down, but it's also going to give a little bit of wiggle room for some variations on the title. So here, when I click through on the city directory, now, now you're looking at the new interface for Google Books, came out about a year ago. I'm not sure again why the magazines weren't popping up, at least Ancestry wasn't when I checked it yesterday. It's still not coming up in the new user interface, but um, generally speaking, this is what it looks like now. And so what you've got is you've got the catalog entry kind of shaded in the background. So it's there, but they've laid the book on top so that really all you're focused on when you're in the book is the book itself. And at the top, there is this search box. So in the past, you had to keep straight between the search box at the top of Google Books, which searched the entire Google Books, and the one that was over on the left, that just searched that book. It could be kind of confusing. So this way, when you use the search box, you are only searching the book on your screen, which is nice. So. I put in Coleman and it found that, you know, a handful of pages where the surname Coleman was showing up. So the speed of this is amazing when you consider the hundreds of pages in the city directory. You can also use this new feature, which is in the new user interface, which makes it awesome. And it's this contents. You're not going to see this with every item that you get, but when it has been indexed in this way and they've linked to the various chapters, you will have this option. So under contents, you can jump to key topics. Sometimes it'll just be divided up by chapters. So it depends how they kind of organize the digitization of this particular book, but it can be very helpful and kind of give you an idea of what some of the main key areas that are available within this particular, particular directory. Every directory had so much different information in it over the years throughout history. So it's just nice to be able to get a quick overview without having to scroll through the entire book. And then when you get done and people, I, I know the first time I used the new interface, I got stuck with this. I was like, how do I get out of here? How do I get to the part that's behind there? Clear the search. So when you clear the search, you sweep the book away and now you'll see just the catalog entry. There's still a button one click and you're back reading the book. So it says read now, you know, read this book. Um, but you'll have all the other stuff that's behind it that you can use as well. And we'll look at that as well. So here's another strategy you could, you could, you could use. Searching for, I did, had two different surnames that were in Minnesota in the 19th century, Rink and Emmerich. I put each in quotation marks and then I put Minnesota in quotation marks. And we're gonna use this tools button. You see, when you're in results, Tools gives you a secondary menu and we're going to select free ebooks. So we're not looking at the books that aren't going to let us read through them anyway. We're just going to the free ones. Now look at this. This immediately brought up, and I wondered if it would, it's a German English city directory for Minnesota because the Emmerichs and the Rinks were both German families on my husband's side. And you can see it's brought up this book it's got the different sections here in the catalog and it says, I, I saw the address book and I thought, okay, well, that's, I'm, I must be looking at a, that kind of a book. I don't know what the rest of it says. I don't read German, but there's a tool built into Google Books to help you do this. Okay, so here's our thumbnail. 
Now it's just basically squares. It's just the checkers. It's not like a button. It's the checkers. So we're going to click that. Let's say I get to this page and I can't read it. I'm going to go to share a clip. I got to it through these three stacked dots. Now I'm just going to draw. It's almost like Evernote. Draw a box around it. Look at the translate button. Click translate. It's going to take the text that it OCR'd that was in an image copy it individually as text, stick it in Google Translate, and translate it for you. So this is a, a chat about German newspapers in our country, the value of the foreign language press. I mean, so instantaneous translation right in Google Books. Surprise! <laughs> I love this. Let's do this next paragraph. Actually, we can do the whole page. Let's see if it can handle it. Sometimes it doesn't handle it as well when it's a huge chunk. It didn't do too bad. Okay, so this is talking about um, the history of German newspapers. So really interesting, German language newspapers in America. So we can use the three stack dots to get to that little clipper, clip the section that's in the foreign language, and then it, we've got the translate button. Pretty cool. And to find both those families. That's why I love putting the show together. I keep finding stuff for my own genealogy <laughs> research. Um, our third surprising item is almanacs. Again, these may not be popping up instantaneously, and you may not even think to look at for them. And when you first put the word almanac in here, look at this. I mean, it's the world almanac, and I don't know that that's going to be that helpful for genealogy. We're going to click Tools, get that drop down menu, and under Any Books, we're going to click free Google eBooks. I just, I don't want to see these color in covers that I know are the modern books. They're not digitized. Now we're looking at the older books and these are digitized. They're available for free. They all have a read button. I can also narrow this down using this same menu. How about just going to 20th century? So 20th century almanacs that are digitized, so fully readable, fully searchable. And we could go to 19th century. Now you might be wondering, well, what good is an almanac going to be? What's interesting as you go through Google Books, and this is one of the powerful things about it, is um, you realize that almanacs 100 years ago, 150 years ago, often had directories in them, had complete listings of every business in the town. So there's a lot more than just what's the weather going to be this year or what happened uh, every month in the last year that we had. Look at this. So this is a almanac and business directory for Boston in 1872. So it, it helps you kind of, as you go through and browse Google Books, it really helps you kind of get a feel for, wow, maybe I didn't realize the terminology that they were using back then. So I'm missing stuff because I'm not asking for almanacs. I'm just focused on city directories. And if it doesn't say city directory, I'm not going to get this one. So keep an eye on almanacs. Almanacs have lots of information. Once you get into the book, then you can do the search on the surname. So if I look up Mahoney, there's a lot of Mahoney's in this almanac. So we can also um, mix this up if I want to look, uh, order it by the page. So from the first page in the book to the last versus the relevance, how many Mahoney's are on the page, that kind of thing. Uh, if you had multiple words, revel, re relevance would be a little bit more significant in terms of sorting. So keep an eye on almanacs. They are a surprise out there. Look at this, the Texas Almanac for 1858. So it has all the, the standard stuff you'd expect, statistics for the state, uh, agricultural, but it's got information on all the churches and schools and charitable institutions and the railroads and everything going on and lots of people in there too. Well worth taking a look. Here I did a search, almanac, and then I put Bill's great-grandfather's name, L.J. Larson. That was most often how he was referred to. I just kind of wanted to see what would happen. I put L.J. Larson in quotation marks to make that phrase mandatory. I didn't want LJ's over here and Larson's over there. And yes, LJ Larson shows up in several, the insurance almanac, the banker's almanac, the CBS news almanac. Yes, <laughs> I guess the store was somehow listed. So uh, he had a, a lumber and hardware store. So surprises to be found when we 
um, put names and locations together with almanac, you might find some great genealogical resources. Number four, governmental and legal publications. Ooh, I know, it doesn't sound thrilling. <laughs> and the way I stumbled into this was that I was thinking about Sydney Mansfield. It's a long story, but I was working on some stuff with the Mansfields. And you remember this picture on the left if you're a tried and true Elevens is with Lisa viewer because I made this massive poster from my family room with this picture that's like this big. So he's in there. He's in the Centennial Syncopators playing for the, um, I think it was the 100th anniversary. <laughs> is that what a Centennial is? Of Oregon, the state of Oregon. Okay. Sidney Mansfield, my husband's grandfather, worked for Rogers 5, 10, and 25 stores. Five and dimes, you know, the standard. And they were in Portland, Oregon. So initially, I was just doing a simple search on Rogers 5 and 10 cent store. And then I started seeing it come up. Now, interesting, in the results, it showed the dashes. And that's because, one, I didn't use quotation marks. But two, the and sign for Google search algorithm doesn't mean anything. It literally just sees a blank space. So it was fine with finding the, the dash in between as another. It's not a search operator, so that's fine. So, And you can look at the picture of the store from the newspaper. That's actually how they wrote it. So I realized, wow, this guy who owns this store, who Sydney was very good friends with, um, is in all these legal cases and federal agencies and hearings. And I was like, wow, this is kind of neat because these are not the kinds of things. They're not ne not always just standard books. They could be, um, you know, a collated manuscript, a book. It could be a report. So we have to get our head out of that. It's just books at Google Books. It's, it's more like a legal report, a findings uh, publication. So there were lots of them here. And I realized that um, I could go look for, how about probate? And yes, if you do a search on probate in Google Books, you're going to find lots of other items as well. Start mixing in names, start mixing in counties and locations. Here we've got the probate records of Essex County, Massachusetts from 1675 to 1681. Fantastic. And it's here. It's free. You see that little read button, you know it's been digitized. It's um, readable right here. In fact, probably downloadable as well and searchable. So that's the key. So think about, hey, at some point, it seems like everybody has some kind of interaction, even if it's just paying taxes or dying. <laughs> you know, there are some kinds of legal type records out there. And Google Books is certainly one of the places that you could look for them. My uh, really surprising, maybe not as surprising, but it might be surprising to you if you haven't used Google Books too much, are the county histories that are out there. And Again, these aren't necessarily popping up in general search results, uh, that searches that you're running, unless you really start asking for them specifically. So I want to make sure that they're on your radar, because there's lots of county histories out there that are fully digitized. And again, in the public domain, they were published before 1924. So many, many of them. And um, this one is from Fresno County. I know we have a lot of folks watching from California. Um, this one is really cool to go through. But I know we've got people from around the world. So I did some searching. Yes, absolutely. There are books worldwide on histories and directories and all kinds of things. This one for Huntingtonshire in um, England, very relevant for me and the Cook family because the Cooks were all from this county in England. So uh, go do a search on some of the other locations, the other countries where you have family in your tree, and you might find there are actually county histories for where they came from as well. Um, this one was really neat. It had a whole history of the, the county, and check this out. Okay, so this, this castle, Hinchinbrook, this is totally significant to the Cook history because Bill's great-grandfather, Harry, forged the gates. He was a blacksmith, and he forged all the gates at Hinchinbrook. So we've actually been there. We got a chance to visit, uh, gosh, about seven years ago now, and took some pictures of the gates. So I love it. it just, it's just one more little piece of the puzzle, one more uh, image. And of course, that image being in this public domain book is one that we could clip. We could use that clipper tool. Now notice, remember I said if you clear the book 
off the screen, you get the, the catalog entry behind it. Click cite uh, is create citation is the button. And if you click that, you get a source citation that you can literally just copy and paste. So that's really handy, handy for the genealogist. We can also come down here and see, is it possible to borrow this book? Now, I might not need to because this one's digitized. But for those books that maybe they're only giving you a little preview, a couple of pages, you'll want to come to the catalog entry, put in your zip code, click search WorldCat. It will go over to this massive WorldCat library catalog online, search it, and it'll tell you where you can actually get your hands on the physical book. This book happens to be at the Michigan State University Libraries. If there were multiple books and you put in your zip code, it would just resort them to show them which one is closest to you. Even better. Even better. All right. So, gosh, we've covered a lot of items, but Compiled Family Histories is one that um, I think nowadays with Ancestry and MyHeritage and all this websites and everything, people don't turn to them as much as they used to. Um, but when I first started, oh gosh, I told you I was a kid when I started. Okay, so actually it was more like when I got really obsessed as an adult with the genealogy, Compiled Family Histories was really big on my radar because at that point we were going always to the library. There wasn't all the online resources and they would have a whole section of compiled family history. So this is the work, much like the family tree that we're seeing online today on all the major genealogy websites. This was the work that people had done before all that. And many of these actually are quite old. So they've done their research. They've published it out in a book form. And these compiled histories are really a wonderful way to kind of jumpstart. We can't assume they're any more accurate than an online family tree, but they oftentimes will have uh, source citations. So if you're, you know, you, you glance through the book and when you start seeing that, that somebody's really done their due diligence and they have cited their sources, they've done their homework, you have a lot of good stuff to deal, to work with, to give you leads in your own research and see if you can verify it and how it lines up with what you've already found. And many times it, of course, expands your tree quite a bit. So there isn't a really super straightforward way to get to compiled histories because um, oftentimes compiled history is not in the title. So that's not going to help us a lot. I just started, I started my search with a very basic word, genealogy, thinking that would be the genealogy of families, right? Just kind of see what happens. And actually, we got quite a few compiled histories right here on the first page of search results. You can see the genealogy of the Page family in Virginia, and that will often be the case. So you could expand your search and you could say genealogy, the surname, and uh, the state, if you're searching in America, um, or just the country, or the county. But oftentimes, those would be the elements that are kind of tagged in the title of the compiled history. And we also see here Genealogical Quarterly Magazine devoted to genealogy, so there's probably some mentions of compiled histories that you might want to track down. A genealogy of the Wilder family of Hawaii and many, many more. Again, the key here, um, when you get your search results page, before you go any further, make sure that that tools button has been clicked and you have your secondary menu so that you can, under any books, select free Google eBooks. Uh, you know, I like to go through those first I, because they're already available. I can use them right here from home. If I don't find what I want, you can always go back to the any books view because there may be books that for whatever reason, they didn't get the permission to publish it, to, to digitize it. And so I want to look through those as well and see what else is out there that maybe I can then use that feature of putting in my zip code, clicking WorldCat and seeing where would I be able to perhaps borrow this book from. So just because a book is not digitized on Google Books doesn't mean that uh, this isn't a fantastic resource for finding it and helping you track it down. 
They also will have links in the catalog entry for where you can even purchase copies if they're available and other lending libraries. So it's a really helpful tool. Let's do a search here in Google Books. I just typed in the word genealogy. So we have this first book as a preview only, so it's not digitized. It's not even a compiled history. That's fine. Um, there's a couple of other genealogy research books, but there's some histories in here. So our tools button is important. Let's make sure that uh, menu is down. We're going to click under any books, free ebooks. Okay, so now we're, we're doing better. I, I want to maybe even sort down to the 19th century. Okay, from there, then maybe we would add in a surname. Um, because that would also help us kind of zero in on just books that have uh, the families that we're looking for. But we're seeing here the genealogy of the Kemper family in the United States, uh, the Russell family, the oh, all kinds of them. Here's the Noyce genealogy, the record of the branch of descendants. And a lot of times, you know, the families and the work is so large that the books will be for, you know, one branch of that family. Let's put in quotation marks the surname Noyce and genealogy, just the word without the quotations, because we don't know if the word genealogy will actually be in the title. There are several books here for the Noyes family. So the descendants of it, uh, other catalogs that have mentioned this family and compiled histories, uh, the genealogy of the descendants of the Griffins, which connects to the Noyes family. So this works really well. We can clear it. Um, I'm going to go here. And um, oh, there we go. So use the surnames, put them in quotation marks to make them mandatory and to make that spelling exact so that it's spelled exactly the way that you put it in there. If you have surnames that have variations, I certainly do in my family, you can have multiple ones. So you could put in genealogy, put noise in uh, quotation marks, and you could also put another surname in quotation marks. I like to put uh, the operator or between the two. And sometimes it makes a big difference. Sometimes it doesn't. But um, you putting multiple versions of the same name is a good way to kind of catch all the spelling variations. <clears throat> this one I'm very excited about because newspapers aren't even technically books. And Google Books is now solving a problem that we have had for a long time. If you've read uh, past versions of my book, The Genealogist Google Toolbox, you know there's always a chapter on the Google News Archive. And in fact, in the most recent edition, uh, I updated as well with everything that's new there. Well, something new that's happening with Google Books is the blending. Okay, so the history of this, you have to, to understand to really fully appreciate this. Google News Archive like Google Books was a standalone search engine. And not only were they over here digitizing books, they were over here digitizing newspapers. That got unwieldy very fast. And for whatever reason, they discontinued it. I don't know if people just weren't using it or weren't finding it. Um, but there are a lot of newspapers that were digitized during that project. So it's been discontinued, but you can still use the website. But the website is lousy. It doesn't have a really good search box. Notice at the top here of the page at the Google News Archive. Now, this is not the, the Google News today. If you could just type in Google News, you're going to get um, the, the most recent news. And then there'll be an archive link. And that archive might go back 10 years. This is a different animal. This is a standalone um, site, Google News Archive. And all these books. At the top, they had a search box, but notice what the buttons say. Search the archive, which is search all of these newspapers, and there's hundreds if not thousands, and thousands of pages, or search the web. When you click through to a specific issue of a newspaper, you would want to be able to search for keywords within that issue, right? Or within that title. You can't. It's really frustrating. <laughs> And part of it is, you know, they kind of, they start turning off some of the resources, I think, uh, associated with projects they've technically discontinued, even though it's still there. Well, now it's actually being brought into Google Books. So check this out. We're going to do a search for Enid Hendry. Okay, search the ar ar archive and you get two results and an ad. <laughs> 
So here's one. Okay. Enid is mentioned. Uh, Miss Enid Hendry represented the Toronto branch. This is out of a Canadian newspaper, the Toronto World. And that's great. But you can't search within this paper for anything else. You have to go back and search the entire collection again. Now you can go to Google Books. If I search for Enid Hendry. Okay, so now we're in the book search. And I see books she's mentioned. And that's interesting, but I want just newspapers. First, I'm going to put quotation marks around her name because I want to make sure that I'm not getting other Enid's and other Hendry's. I want that phrase. But now I really want uh, newspapers. And you can now sort by any document and select newspapers. So they have taken the news archive, incorporated it into Google Books, which has a far superior search engine. Look how many results it found. So way better than even just searching within the old news archive. Um, lots of entries. Some of them are duplicate, some are not. Some of them are finding her mentioned in multiple articles. Her family seemed to be kind of busy over there. I don't know. Here's from 1913, 1891. There's lots of different years here. So in the society column, not surprising, we find Miss Enid. And let's see where she is here. It, you notice the yellow bar on the right hand side. It's very small, but it's where you would move the mouse. That shows you you should be right there on the page. And there's Miss Enid Hendry has gone to High River, Alberta to visit her aunt. Okay. Just like magazines, you're looking at the old user interface. Maybe they just haven't switched it over yet. So we're going to use the, the search box on the left hand side to search within this paper. And yes, indeed, it turns out that Hendry is mentioned a couple of different times. It looks like maybe this is her mother. We don't know. Uh, Mrs. Hendry gave a dinner. Um, at Homestead Saturday and well, Miss Enid Hendry attended. So there's a relationship there. So when you're looking at the paper and we're zoomed in quite a bit now, but if you were zoomed out, that little yellow marker would give you a little indication kind of where on the page to start reading. But look what it's doing a great job. It's actually putting in a highlight for you the name that you were looking for. So one of the things I would encourage you to do is um, Go check the Google News Archive to see, do they have the paper you want? If they do, hop over to Google Books. That's where you need to be searching, not in the Google News Archive. So I, I went over here. Not only do they have the Winthrop News because Larson popped up, my LJ Larson, but then I got concerned about, well, I wonder what issues they have. It's a little hard to sort in Google Books, but if you go back to Google News Archive, it tells you. The Winthrop News they have from 1922 to 2009, they've got 461 issues. Yay! Yay for me! <laughs> I was pretty excited. That's not always going to be the case, but you can now use these in tandem to help you accomplish your goals. Now our eighth item here are journals. And here is a journal that uh, I just love because I was looking for horseless carriage exhibition. I have this photo down here on the page. Um, Harry Cook was at this horseless carriage exhibition. He worked for the man who was um, holding it in England. And I did a search and then found this, I guess it's a journal, it's a monthly journal that came out. It's basically like a magazine, but it's a compilation of this newfangled machine that was exciting everybody. And they put this out on a monthly basis. Once I got it within the journal, I did a search for Solomon's and look at this. I found another version of the same picture. It's not, and it's not inverted. I've, I've compared the two. They're actually just slightly, slightly different, taken from slightly different angles. So really cool. Um, that term journal, just like almanac, is one that you want to kind of get in your hit list for when you're searching on Google Books. So how about genealogy journals? That term, again, maybe used more in the past for some, maybe the National uh, Genealogical Society, I think they might use journals as well. But when you go in here and just type in genealogy journal, you're going to get lots of great stuff. And then you can start zeroing in on locations and on surnames. So thinking about the terminology that we don't necessarily have on the forefront of our mind, 
is going to be really effective when we're searching within Google Books. Here are several different journals I found. And um, the Utah Genealogical and Historical Magazine um, it came up when I was searching for journals because that was one of the words they used within this publication. Um, there's also other journals with just all kinds of, of names and families and, and good stuff to find. Maps. Now, we're not going to find individual published maps, but books have maps and books often have unique maps. I'm going to search for my Randolph County uh, genealog- uh, County history from Indiana. Go to free ebooks. Here's the county history from 1882. Oftentimes, books, the old books found in Google Books, will have maps. And we could even add the word map because often, you know, they'll, at some point in the index, in the table of context, they're going to say, hey, we have a map in this book. So adding the word map in quotes can really help. So I'm going to use my, my thumbnail, my tiles to get that big picture view of the entire book. And now we can spot exactly where our um, maps and images and tables and all kinds of stuff. Are there maps in here? Yes. There's a cemetery map. There's plat maps. Here's Stony Creek. And they've written the names of the owners of the property on every single piece of property. So we could go to that little three stacked dots and we could do a clipping. So let's grab the image out of the book. We're going to draw our clipper around the map. We're not using the, the translate button. We're going to go down here to image. Image is the link. The image you just click, clipped has its own URL. We're going to copy it. Just click the copy button. Go to a new tab in your web browser and paste that address hit enter and now you have only the image so while you couldn't search exactly for single images you can grab them out of the books and now we can right click on this on my pc and do save image as and i can download this to my hard drive so this map being in a public domain book they've already cleared the copyright that's why it's digitized now i can use that in google earth in my publications in my books whatever it is a powerpoint it's really cool. Look for old maps because sometimes the maps found in books are one of a kind. You're not going to find them anywhere else. And the same goes for our 10th item. Surprise, photographs and images. Again, we're not searching for standalone images. We're really targeting the books that are going to have the images and then we're going to extract them out. So I went back to my county history. I'm going to Click my tiles, get the big picture view, which is the fastest way for sure to spot the engravings, the, the photographs, all this good stuff. If we see one here and we think, oh, our, our ancestors attended this church, maybe I want that one. Here is uh, the bank. So we can go through here very quickly assess, is this your ancestor? If it is, we can click that three stacked dots and get the clipper tool and we could go and take a clipping save that url and save image as oh look at our side by side view super cool shows us the whole layout very grand we don't always know how totally accurate these these were it was a little bit of a brag book but <laughs> that's okay really fun look for photographs and images and uh, let's do this here. Back into my county history, I'm going to search within the book. And I'm going to look for the surname Claw or Clough. And you can already see where the pictures are. Look at that. We've got their house and we've got the drawings. And they might be photos, they might be engravings or drawings, um, but it's a wonderful, quick way to do this. I'm again going to do my share a clip. You might be sharing it with yourself, might be sharing it with somebody else. You could email that link to somebody. You could paste that link somewhere else. Or you can use the link in a tab to save the image directly to your hard drive. So lots of different options for sharing the stuff that you're finding in books. And check this out. Yes, photographs as well. So uh, here's lovely Julia Beatrice. 
Kinney, Metcalf of 1909. Who knows? I always hope that sometimes when I show examples, there'll be somebody in the chat goes, me, that's my family. Wouldn't that be awesome? So there you have it, my friend. 10 kind of surprising things at Google Books. Uh, Maybe things that you didn't know were there or you've uh, looked at before, but you need to get back and check it out. For sure, it's surprising now that uh, the newspaper archive is so much more searchable. I'm so happy about this Uh, over at Google Books and using those terms that we don't always think about like almanac, but that they could bring up um, something new that would be a wonderful, wonderful surprise for us. So, oh, I made a black screen. Let me jump back here to chat and see how you guys are doing. Um, could you find diaries, journals, manuscripts? Yes. It, was it published? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. You watch it twice. And you know what? Of course, come back to um, the show notes, which I'll have for in the next day or so. Um, it's going to be another late night, Steve. I know. I know. But you know, that's part of the fun. Um, I'm really glad you guys enjoyed it. I was, you know, hoping that you would see, obviously, there'll be many things here that you maybe have been familiar with before, but there's nothing better than just seeing something brand new in a good old place that you've been to before. Maybe you've never even thought about Google Books before. Um, Thank you so much, you guys. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Awesome. How current is your book, The Genealogist Google Toolbox? Well, in fact, it's extremely current. Um, I published it in January. It was completely updated and it has brand new chapters as well. So has full chapters on how I'm using Google Photos for family history and identifying ancestors. It's got uh, new chapters on Chrome browsing and techniques. And so it's all been fully updated and good to go. It's at genealogygems.com in the store. Uh, Now I'll have more hours for searching. Cleaning house? No, Kathleen's not going to be cleaning her house. (laughs) I love it, you guys. You guys are awesome. All right. Um, Well, I promised you the surprising thing that happened to me this week. And um, I will go through the rest of the chat and answer any other questions that you guys have in the show notes. So be sure and check those out in the next day or so over at genealogygems.com. Just under video, go to 11s is with Lisa, and you'll get those there. If you're a premium member, you get the ad-free version in a PDF form so that you can download it, and it's all searchable, and that's just a little bonus for being a premium member. So, um, okay, so what happened to me a couple of weeks ago, we're watching uh, TV, and um, I get a message through Ancestry.com. I know what you're thinking. Oh my gosh, it's a DNA thing. <laughs> okay, so this gal reach out, reaches out to me and she says she's researching not one, but two adoptions. So there's the grandmother who's been adopted, and this is her friend. Oh, well, she says it's her friend. So there's the grandmother that's adopted and the granddaughter was adopted, and she's still alive. Okay, so... We did some some searching. She had some theories. I looked into it. I talked to my dad. And yeah, we think that it's my dad's aunt who was the mother, uh, the grandmother. And it was really interesting because, you know, when somebody brings up something like this and, and you are the family historian and you think you've talked to everybody. I've interviewed my dad dozens of times. I mentioned this to him and all of a sudden this story comes out. Well, yeah, I think back in 1927, we're we're thinking that Ethel may have had a child and there was talk about that in the family. And then recently, uh, his cousin passed away just last week. And so he was 80 and he went to visit another cousin and they got talking and they said, Oh, yeah, that was the story. (laughs) So it's funny how people don't mention those things. Um, I guess that just wasn't the way back then I can appreciate that. So anyway, it turned out that yeah, there was this connection with my dad's side of the family. And uh, so that was really interesting. It was kind of a surprise. Um, In the email conversations with this gal who was doing the research, she just kind of happened to say, oh, yeah, well, I've pulled all the birth records for your your entire family and everything. And I got to tell you, that's that's a little weird when some you're alive, right? (laughs) We tend to think of the living people stuff as kind of private. But it's really odd when somebody writes you and says, oh, yeah, I've got your birth certificate. I've got, you know, your sisters. I've got all your parents, all this stuff. And then she said, and what's it like being a twin? Huh? (laughs) 
I was like, what? And I'm reading this. And I look up at Bill. I said, she says I'm a twin. And I've never heard this in my entire life. So, of course, the movie stops midstream. And Bill's like, what's going on? I said, hold everything. I'm going to Ancestry. I have my computer my laptop, my laptop on my lap. And I go into a search. And I find my record in the birth index. Okay, well, that should be there, right? So then I thought, okay, I'm... So I did a search on just my birth date and the place where I was born. And up pops Elizabeth L. With my maiden name. And she has my birth date. And she has my mother's maiden name. That was a surprise. Okay, so my first thought was, well, my name is, and you might be thinking this too, my name is Lisa. And so, well, Lisa is an abbreviation, if you will, of a short nickname version of Elizabeth. Okay, I guess Elizabeth is, is a variation on that as well. But I always thought I was always just a Lisa. Okay, well, then I got to thinking, if you've ever met my grandmother, which you haven't, but my grandmother, she was awesome. But man, she just had a mind of her own. She was a maternity nurse and a head supervisor in the maternity hall for 50 years. She was my mother's maternity nurse. And I got to thinking, well, maybe this is just a case of if the maternity nurse helps the mom fill out the birth certificate stuff. And of course, my grandmother, with opinions of her own, would have gotten that paper out and said, well, this is Elizabeth. And my mom's like, no, it's Lisa. So there's got to be an error here, right? (laughs) Okay. So then I get, I get on the phone. Thank goodness my dad is on the West Coast because it's 10 o'clock my time and I'm calling him up. Okay, what's the deal? There's this gir- this woman, this girl is in the birth index for our state and she's got my birth date. She's got mom's maiden name. Um, what do you think? And he said, absolutely not. I have never heard of such a thing. And by the way, and I won't use the expletives that he used, but <laughs> he's like, and by the way, they didn't let men go in the in the you know, delivery. So I have no clue. I have no clue. But I'm telling you, I can tell you one thing he said, your name was Lisa from the get go. It was not short for anything. Your mother was absolutely committed to having your name being Lisa. And of course, Lisa was the most popular name in the United States of America the year I was born. Not a surprise. So what do I got to do? Well, I wrote and I tracked down how to get in touch with the county recorder. And I found the form, got it all filled out, mailed in my check. And I'm thinking, I'm preparing myself for a couple of weeks, you know, to get an answer back. I get a phone call in just a couple of days. And the woman on the other end is like, um, hi, I'm working on your, your request. And I said, okay. She's like, is, is this for you? Or who is this for? And I start to go, well, because, you know, it's complicated. And she goes, oh, no, 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 I have your birth certificate here. And I said, why? Is there a problem? And she says, no, it's just that this person doesn't exist. There is no birth certificate in our records. There never has been. It's not in our index. And I just didn't want to tell you that you weren't a real person (laughs) or that somehow this was an adoption case. So I was like, oh, my gosh. And so I start talking. You, know, you get on the phone and you're talking to the recorder going, well, you know, my grandmother was a maternity nurse. I don't know. Maybe she was doing it. I talked to my dad. Anyway, she was fascinated. But I, as it turned out, absolutely, there is no birth certificate. It is not a real person. So the bottom line, and I think the thing that was so interesting was, is that one, there's always things that pop up and they're not always necessarily just DNA mysteries. But two, Even, and and this is really the lesson for all of us, isn't it? Even when you see a record that looks official, even if it was the actual form, you know, when you see that on a website, that doesn't mean it's true. And, you know, they sent me the letter to reconfirm, I'm sorry, there is no such person in this state (laughs) by this name on that date. And particularly when it comes to indexes. So, you know, it's wonderful to have these indexes, but this is totally inaccurate. Now, I went through and I looked at it and I started to realize there were other Elizabeths in this county. So my theory is that they did my birth certificate index entry, they get her name, and then when they look back to transcribe it, they're back up on my listing again. And they've added all my information 
verbatim for this other name. Or else it was my grandmother asserting herself. I don't know. <laughs> but I just thought it was, um, it was a very interesting couple of weeks. So all I can tell you is next week, there's only going to be one of me here, as always. And I look forward to talking to you. I hope you have a wonderful, surprising week in Google Books. Thanks so much for watching, you guys. Talk to you soon.